The series title is the Northridge Earthquake 30 Years Later, A Catalyst for Engineering Resilient Communities. And this is a partnership of the American Society of Civil Engineers, Infrastructure Resilience Division, the ASCE Los Angeles section, the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute Southern California chapter, the Structural Engineers Association of Southern California, and the Earthquake Country Alliance. My name is Mark Benthe, and I'm with the Statewide California Earthquake Center. I also lead the Earthquake Country Alliance, and we're helping to coordinate activities throughout the year in commemoration of the 30th anniversary of Northridge. And this series is a, a big part of that. And today's uh, episode is uh, focused on the science and engineering aspects of the January 17th, 1994 Northridge earthquake. Next slide. And we have four uh, fantastic presenters today uh, on di these, these different topics of geophysics. We have Ken Hudnut, now with Southern California Edison, for the geotechnical engineering aspects, Jonathan Stewart at UCLA, for Lifeline Infrastructure Systems, Craig Davis, and for structural engineering, David Koch. So we're going to start with Ken Hudnut. And uh, how this is gonna work is each pr presenter is going to give their presentation about 15 minutes. We're going to have questions at the end. However, there is uh, in the, if you look at your toolbar, you'll see a Q and A section or Q and A button. That is where we, you are able to enter questions that will be answered. We may answer them by uh, text, and if they are answered that way, you will be able to find those in that Q&A portal that you can get to by clicking on your, your menu bar. And you'll look under answered uh, to see the answer to answers to your questions answered by text. But we will also answer questions at the end. So please, as we go through, be adding your questions using the Q&A tool. With that, we'll go ahead and uh, and switch to bring up Ken Hunnett's slide. Ken Hunnett has led the Seismic Resiliency Program for Southern California Edison for three years. He advises leadership, guiding their efficient investment towards improving seismic resiliency of the electric power grid. Prior to Edison, he served as a geophysicist at the United States Geological Survey in Pasadena for 28 years. In this role, he responded to significant domestic and international earthquakes, conducted research on fault interaction and earthquake rupture processes, and applied new technologies to earthquake science. Ken, thank you very much. Uh, you're ready to go. Great. Thanks a lot, Mark. I appreciate the opportunity to speak, and I, I do believe that the Northridge earthquake was a catalyst. It was also a transformative event, and that's going to be our one of our themes here. Um, that the the work of the earth scientists and the earthquake engineers together was so important in how we responded to the earthquake, how we then went about restoring the infrastructure and getting the community back on its feet. It was overall a resilient response. Was there room for improvement? Sure. And in the 30 years since then, there's been tremendous improvement. Uh, from the earth science perspective, which I'll be representing here, I'm going to give an overview and, and talk about how we characterize the source of the earthquake within the first few days and within the first week after its occurrence. And I'll be focusing on those things, but I also want to keep coming back to that theme about how things have been made better since then, so that if we have a future big earthquake, we collectively, the earthquake engineers and earth scientists will be able to respond even better than we were able to back then. So we've been taking advantage of all the new technologies that have been coming along. Okay, so um, with that, I'm going to move into the slides. I'm gonna start by saying something quite obvious and that is California is earthquake country. Um, however, we're constantly challenged as a community of uh, technical minded people that uh, there can be complacency that sets in. And another thing I think that David in particular is gonna come back to later in this um, webinar is that um, Northridge was not the big one. And so you see here, however, um, it was the last major urban hit in LA. 
Um, it's within memory for many of us, but many people probably listening in here weren't even born yet. And so um, what we're trying to do here overall is to convey how we responded, everything that went down from our perspectives at that time. And um, so this photograph says a lot, right? You have within this one image, earthquake damage. This was in, in case of uh, where there was a lateral spread that um, others, Craig, may talk more about. But here you see some damage to electric distribution infrastructure as well as to a gas line. And there was also a water rupture line in this case. So the infrastructure damage represented here, it just shows how when we have the urban fabric and all of people's houses and all of the infrastructure needed to support a big city, when you have an earthquake in and amongst it, it can, can cause a lot of disruption. And so um, this is just meant to represent all of that. Now, I mentioned Northridge was a transformative event. It followed the 1971 earthquake, which of course was also a transformative event. And I'll allude back to that in some of what I'll present here. Uh, but I wanted to actually create a longer story arc. So 1971 earthquake was 23 years before Northridge and now we're 30 years beyond Northridge. So I wanted to paint that slightly larger picture and also take a step back. So let's jump out into space and we're gonna take a look at the San Andreas fault system and what we call the big bend, which is like a wrinkle in the transform plate boundary. So I'm making a little bit of a play on words here using transformative for Northridge earthquake, but also it's the San Andreas transform plate boundary. So let's take a look at that bigger picture as we get into the presentation here. But I wanted to give an overall sequence of what I'm gonna present. And then at the end, I'll try to come back to tie it all together. So because of the Big Bend, there is some compression perpendicular to the San Andreas Fault transform boundary. That compression gives rise to reverse or thrust faulting. We have different names for it, and we use the word blind thrust faulting to represent earthquakes that are on thrust compressional faults that don't reach the ground surface. Well, Mother Nature had conveniently been trying to give us a big old heads up prior to the occurrence of the Northridge earthquake. And what I mean by that, by shots across the bow, by warning messages being sent to us, our community had been seeing events already that were comparable in some ways. So the 71 San Fernando, also known as Silmar earthquake. Um, and then we had this uh, 1980 sequence, New Idria, Coalinga, Kettleman Hill sequence, um, that was written up nicely by Ross Stein and his colleagues at the time. These were blind thrust events on a fold and thrust belt sub parallel to the San Andreas, again, resulting from compression perpendicular or orthogonal to the San Andreas. In addition, we had the 1987 Whittier Narrows earthquake in the LA basin that was also part of this heads up we were getting. And then the Sierra Madre 1991 earthquake as well. So if you look back on it, you know, retro yeah, hindsight 2020, you know, you know, it's it's clearer when you have that benefit of hindsight. Um, but at the time when Northridge hit, those things had led up to it. And we had learned a lot from these other earthquakes. So it's not like we didn't know anything. I think when the Northridge earthquake happened, though, there were some surprises. So it may have looked at the time like we didn't know what was going on. And there's an element of truth to that. But I also want to get to uh, what's next, in particular for the LA metro area. There's been a lot written and this, much of it in the 30 years since Northridge about the other line thrust faults, the other fault bend fold, fault propagation fold type structures that are underneath Los Angeles. Plenty Hills thrust jumps to mind. There are many others. And so these are now included in the SCEC community product called the CFM. And I'll show one sample image from that, but as you probably all know, that's an openly available product. It has not only the main preferred fault geometry, but also alternative fault geometries represented. And bottom line of all of that is that LA is underlain by a whole bunch of faults. And because they're blind faults, it's hard to know as much about them as faults that come up to the surface. Okay, so I mentioned this um, ties into the theme of earthquake engineers and earth scientists working together. When we work together, we can achieve great things, no doubt about it. And this is really exemplified by the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, which was 
designed through a joint project by the engineers and earth scientists. And then when the Denali earthquake hit, magnitude 7.9 strike slip event in 2002, that worked and not a single drop of oil was spilled. So we all know that when we work well together, we can achieve great things. So I'll go through the source characteristics of the Northridge earthquake. Um, so understanding the earthquake source, of course, relies on good data. And in 1971, we started to get some really great data from strong motion instruments in the near field. And then in 1994, Northridge, again, we got really good data. And so we were able to quickly characterize the earthquake source. So we'll step through that a bit. We'll talk about how each of these earthquakes motivated improvements to the seismic network. So if you look back at some of the things said after the 71 earthquake, it was clearly a motivation to the seismic network operators at Caltech to bring in USGS, densify the network. And so then again, Northridge motivated a next round of seismic network and earthquake monitoring improvements for the region. So I'll cover those things. And then um, this theme of how we kept incorporating new technologies as we were able to do so. This allowed us to get faster and better at earthquake source estimation, and it even has led to earthquake early warning. So as I said, transformational, the seismic network and operations of the networks, as well as analysis, quick analysis of the records that we were getting, and also turning those around and getting them out to the community quickly after they've been checked. This is all part and parcel of what John Stewart and his many colleagues have been working on very hard to try to bring through high quality data recording all the way through and into operational use, but then beyond that into use for design for new building construction and also retrofitting of existing buildings. So important. Now, when it comes to the monitoring of earthquakes, the other thing that Northridge allowed was uh, incorporation of geodetic network capability along with seismic network capability so that now um, how we monitor earthquakes has changed fundamentally and it's gotten much better. We've gone from non-continuous survey mode GPS to continuously operating networks. And even with geology, these are the big three, seismic, geodetic, and geologic that I'm covering. So with geologic capabilities, there's also been a transformation. Now we can have a drone up quickly or do airborne LIDAR mapping of surface rupture. And in terms of multi-channel seismic data and the SCEC CFM that I mentioned, our ability to more accurately represent deep faults has really improved. <clears throat> Now, finally, the last point here is we're gonna cover hanging wall near fault ground motions from 1971 and especially 1994. And then even there's this latest example from this year in Japan of where these near fault ground motions can be large and we need to figure out um, how to incorporate that into future building codes. So I'm gonna try to cover all of this. So I'm gonna move fast. So the, the San Andreas Fault, as I mentioned, if we look from space, it looks like this. You're looking from the southeast across the Salton Sea in the lower center of the image. And then out into the distance, you're looking at where that um, New Idria Colinga Kettleman Hills sequence occurred, where you see Thule fog in the San Joaquin Valley up in the top center of the, of the uh, photograph. So here you see the San Andreas Fault diagonaling across the state. And right in through here is what we call the Big Bend. You can see how this Coachella section is well aligned with the North American Pacific plate boundary, northwest, southeast oriented, and it has nearly pure right lateral strike slip on it. But where we go through the Big Bend, you see the transverse ranges lifting up and that's where the Northridge earthquake occurred. And so it helped contribute to the increase in elevation, the rising of the mountain range in the Santa Susana Mountains on the north side of the San Fernando Valley. So this illustration on the right you see is our best effort to make a 3D block diagram to convey and simplify what I'm telling you here from looking at that nice uh, space shuttle photo on the left. You see the uh, compression represented here by the Big Bend and you see these arrows showing how it's just misaligned and that compression is resulting in the mountain ranges and the thrust faulting. And this is showing from the sign fact sheet how we then applied use of the GPS system 
to measure that compressional component that's orthogonal to the San Andreas, as well as measuring the main right lateral strike slip across the whole plate boundary. Now, this is from the Lucy, Dr. Lucy Jones et al. papered in science right after the Northridge earthquake. And it shows you that there had been other uh, big earthquakes in California history on these other faults. You see the big red line along the San Andreas representing the 1857 rupture extent. And then you also see the other earthquakes that have occurred um, and including here the occurrence of the 71 San Fernando earthquake and then right next to it, the Northridge earthquake location. So um, with the San Andreas fault zone in this block diagram on the left, you see represented here the right lateral movement on the San Andreas. And then this is from uh, Gary Fuisadal fact sheet. And you can see how the geometry of these thrust faults relates to the San Andreas, to the San Gabriel Mountains, which are being uplifted. And then here you see the Sierra Madre 1991 event on the frontal fault system and then stepping out from it, the Whittier Narrows event of 87, and then going out into the basin with a fault propagation fold that's blind out here. <clears throat> so you can picture how the Northridge earthquake occurred along a similar system of faults, but we'll get into that in just a moment. I mentioned the SCEC CFM, and this is the one uh, screenshot that I'll be including from that. You see here annotated is they've got the light blue line representing the coastline and this blue circle here representing LA city center. And here you have the fault plane that broke in the Northridge earthquake in yellow. The other blind thrust faults underlying LA are shown in red. And so this is just to illustrate the point that we have complex faulting underneath LA. It's not all about the strike slip faults. It's very importantly also about the, these compressional faults both blind ones and ones that come to the surface. An awful lot of research has been done on the Northridge earthquake. And of course, I can't possibly summarize all of it. So what I'm gonna to try to do with this, which, which is from Jay Patton, he does a lovely job with a lot of earthquakes to, to compile information from all different sources and put it all together into these nice posters like this one. So for the Northridge earthquake, <clears throat> you have, shown here, just little snapshots, little glimpses of all the important things that we know of it. <clears throat> and so here's that block diagram starting from there, you've got geological maps and the occurrence of other earthquakes surrounding it. And then the shaking pattern from the Northridge earthquake. And what I wanted to come around to though, is this diagram here, and we'll look at it more closely, but I wanted to make the overall point here that a lot's been done on the Northridge earthquake. This is just one drop quote from the main USGS led report on the Northridge earthquake. And that's shown here, there's a link to it. I'm gonna just keep skipping through quickly because I know I'm gonna be going over time if I don't get going faster. So from this report, which is linked on that previous slide, I'm gonna show a little bit more about the main shock. So this was the USGS effort to put together all the best available information. And two years after Northridge, this was the report done for FEMA. And here, what I wanted to just show is that the 71 earthquake and its aftershocks were on a north dipping fault going down underneath the San Gabriel range. Counter to that, the Northridge main shock was on a south dipping plane. And it took a little while for this aftershock clarity to emerge within the first few days, it was not crystal clear yet. And so there was this ambiguity because of the focal mechanism ambiguity about which plane broke. And it would have been more like 71 if the north dipping plane had broken, but instead the south dipping plane broke. And so it was partly like a, a kind of a race, uh, kind of a uh, at the starting gun at the time of the Northridge earthquake, everybody set off running <clears throat> to try to figure out what had happened in the earthquake. And you know the seismic network didn't work perfectly right at first, and so there was, you know, this sort of jostling, and let's see what else we can do to figure it out. <clears throat> In the end, we used seismic data, geodetic data all together. This is a snapshot of the earthquake shaking on the left, showing peak ground velocity. You can see how the epicenter is depicted here, and it was the south dipping plane. The earthquake began at depth and then ruptured up dip and toward the northwest, which created a highest um, peak ground velocity pattern shown here. And this was the result of the 
source of the earthquake going up and over on the fault plane as it ruptured up dip. So here you see it depicted with the overall sense of movement with the slip going up and northwest that created this directivity to the shaking and also strong shaking in the hanging wall. Okay, so um, I've already covered some of these points and I, know I need to move fast through the remainder of the talk. So I'm gonna just start skipping through a bit, but just making the point again that the 71 earthquake motivated changes that were intentionally going in the direction of moving the earthquake monitoring network operations from more of a research mode in the old days, beginning 1932 on up through the time of the 71 earthquake, that motivated a change to a more operational ready state to help emergency managers. And then with the 94 earthquake, Tom Heaton himself also was importantly involved in getting funding for Trinet along with a large team of many others working on that. And that was, as I said, a transformative change. And I mentioned too about the GPS, I already covered that point. So I'm gonna keep moving and just show examples of the instrumentation in place at the time of 94. And uh, those instruments did uh, clip go off scale. And so now the modern digital broadband stations and um, strong motion equipment accompanying those is much less likely to have such problems. And so there's been continuous improvement in the monitoring capabilities. Same goes for the geodetic work. This is showing the old geodolite project. And then um, I'll get around to this in just a moment, but the uh, use of GPS satellite technology really helped transform it to a continuous mode of operation. Here you see that with time, the ability to detect plate tectonic rates increased um, really exponentially over this period of time. And in 94, at the time of Northridge, GPS was still being tested versus other geodetic methods like the geodolite that you just saw. And so we had to prove that GPS could work even better. So all of that was happening when Northridge hit. And here's how we used to do it at the time of Northridge. We would set up an antenna on a tripod, make observations, return back to the office from the field, process the data. And that took some time, days, and and then we'd model it. And this work was done importantly involving Mark Murray from USGS at the time, who used the Monte Carlo approach to finding a best fitting source model for the early GPS data that we were getting within the first few days, within the first week. So he contributed that and I worked on doing a distributed slip model. And this was exciting because we were able to use GPS to help um, solve and characterize the earthquake source relatively quickly at the time. And we showed that it was on the south dipping plane. So yes, there was this uh, contribution from GPS that I wanna highlight, but briefly here, and that is to say uh, 1971 dip north, but 1994, we were still trying to figure it out and the aftershocks weren't clear yet. And so the GPS displacement pattern showed a strong preference for this south dipping plane. So this was part of solving the puzzle. And it showed the power of the GPS technology, which we then, as a big team effort, a group of us uh, formed the sign project that was led through SCEC. And this is showing a modern continuously operating GPS station that this team of us innovated. This is from Isla Guadalupe, but um, now there are well over a thousand such stations monitoring earthquake activity throughout the United States, North America and beyond. And so uh, the Northridge earthquake helped lead to that transformation and adoption of the GPS technology, what's now called GNSS. I don't think I have time to really cover early warning, but just to say that GPS is now com contributing along with seismic instrumentation to the earth operational earthquake early warning system. And this shows that longer arc starting with 71 and going to the future of how collectively this uh, earthquake engineering and earth scientists team effort has taken us from you know, the old days and through adding more stations, building better networks and through creative people working together we were able to adopt new technologies and go through this transformational change from analog recording to digital and incorporating the GPS revolution. And this was through also um, at the same time improved collaboration between scientists and engineers over the same time interval. Everything's gotten faster and better to the point where we can now issue timely alerts and even give people heads up time before they experience shaking. So the future, what does the future hold? 
I want to just emphasize the point that all of you, including early career folks that are out there watching this, you can make a difference. And I would encourage you, like Tom Heaton encouraged me, to focus on the important problems. Overall, we've moved from back at the time of 71, less robust network performance through innovation and transfer transformational change to more robust performance of our networks. When I say how you can make a difference and to focus on the important problems, I want to segue to John's presentation and focus on something that along with that arc that we just saw, from the time of the 71 earthquake, there were early indications that, were, that there were large hanging wall ground motions. And in this paper by Allen and others, they refer back to an even earlier result shown at the top right, which was from the 1897 Assam earthquake by Oldham, in which he analyzed stones that had been, monuments that had been tossed up out of the ground, popped out of their sockets. And so we're seeing more and more evidence for very strong ground motions in the near fault area. And this is not only for uh, hanging wall motions for thrust faulting, but also seen in near fault regions for strike slip earthquakes lately. So this is opening up a much bigger topic and this is just picking a few references from all the important work that's been done on this. But with that, I just wanted to say, we collectively, those of us presenting this webinar all feel that this is really one of the most important problems that remains to be solved and it can benefit from the collaboration between earthquake scientists and engineers. So with that, I'd like to end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. As mentioned earlier, or if you've just joined, we are taking questions at the end. If you do have any questions for Ken and, and all of the present presenters, please use the Q&A tool uh, in your toolbar to add your questions. Uh, next up, we're going to hear from Jonathan Stewart, uh, who performs teaching, research, and professional work related to hazard characterization, such as ground motion and ground failure, and infrastructure response to those hazards, including soil response systems and distributed infrastructure systems. He has held leadership positions at UCLA, ASCE, and EERI, and actively works with various governmental agencies on issues related to seismic risk. John. Thank you, Mark. I'm uh, glad to be with you all today. Um, so at the time of the Northridge earthquake, uh, I was a grad student up at Berkeley. Um, and as part of what I was doing as a grad student, we got heavily involved in documenting the geotechnical engineering impacts of this earthquake. Um, and so I, I do have that background. Um, one of the other things I do is um, I'm involved in ground motion uh, modeling, development of ground motion models through next generation attenuation projects and liquefaction models through the NGL project. And I'll bring the perspective of using field data in model development into what I say today. What I'll be trying to do is talk about some of the salient features of ground motions and ground failure from the earthquake as a whole, but I'm going to try to also focus in on how the data from Northridge remains highly relevant and in fact challenges us uh, as we develop models even today. So I'll start with the ground motion topic. And in order to provide a little perspective on uh, the value of Northridge, uh, let's actually go back to 71. Uh, Ken mentioned the 71 Silmar earthquake. The map on the right is showing, um, hopefully you can see my cursor, it's showing this yellow area. So that is the fault rupture surface for this earthquake. The line here is the shallowest part, and this is the location of the hypocenter. So it was rupturing up to the south in this case. The little triangles are ground motions for this earthquake that are in the NGA databases. There are 44 in total. So there's some that are beyond the range of the map, but you can see that they're fairly sparse certainly by today's perspective, although at the time of this earthquake, this was the best recorded one that we had. There were 44 in total. The only one that was really very close to the fault was this one here at the Coima Dam. Now let's go forward uh, to 1994. This is the same thing, but for the Northridge earthquake, we see the Northridge fault here. It's uh, epicenter illustrated by this focal mechanism, and you see far more sensors 
uh, distributed around the area. 160 in total recordings of this earthquake, three component recordings in the NGA database. And there's quite a few now that are right in close to the fault. I would just like to highlight that in this region, the, the rupture is propagating uh, to the north. And there is a whole series of uh, instruments here that are capturing forward rupture directivity effects. There are also instruments, not as many, but some down here recording the backward directivity effects. We really want to be able to see both in order to differentiate them. And then we have everything that is within the red square. This is hanging wall, uh, the hanging wall of the fault. And any sensors that you see there are recording ground motions on that hanging wall. And I'll have some more to say about the importance of those sensors as we go along. Just to, to jump to the present time, so what are we looking at with uh, modern earthquakes? So this map shows all the sensors uh, within the field of this map that are currently in the uh, ground motion database that we're working with for NGA. Uh, the major providers of data in this region are the Southern California Seismic Network, uh, California Strong Motion Instrumentation Program, USGS, and the uh, Community Seismic Network, CSN, that's a fairly recent one that provides this very dense coverage through uh, parts of urban Los Angeles. Over 1,600 stations are shown in this figure. A typical magnitude five or so earthquake uh, nowadays is producing between five and 700 recordings, three component recordings. Uh, and so we're obviously just going, getting more and more. But at the time of Northridge, that was the best recorded earthquake in the world. So let's ask the question, are these Northridge earthquake ground motions still important for what we're trying to do today? So the answer is yes. I suppose if the answer were no, we wouldn't be all convened here uh, this afternoon. Uh, and I'm going to, there's a lot of ways that it's valuable. I'm going to just try to highlight um, one of them, which is that it's a valuable data set for kind of a, a moderate magnitude reverse slip event. As Ken mentioned, this is not the quote unquote big one, but it's pretty good size and I would call it moderate magnitude. And we get a lot of these within our earthquake rupture forecasts. So what I would like to highlight so that you can understand the value of the earthquake is the hanging wall uh, aspects of this. This is a schematic uh, where this is the ground surface. It's a profile view. This is the fault here, uh, a dipping fault. You have the hanging wall is over the, over the fault surface and the foot wall is on the other side. So we have a blue sensor on the foot wall and a red one on the hanging wall. This distance parameter used in ground motion models, Rx, is measured from the top of the fault going uh, perpendicular to the strike, and it's positive if you're on the hanging wall, and it's negative if you're on the foot wall. This is uh, that schematic now from a plan view perspective. So this is the shallow part. The hanging wall is here. We see the foot wall record in this space, the hanging wall record over the fault. Rx negative, Rx positive. And when we make models for these hanging wall effects, they will be fully active throughout this space. Even once you get off the hanging wall and you get into the region back here, there's a transition zone. And then there is no effect as you get off to the sides. So uh, what we're looking at here is uh, the variation of ground motion, in this case, PGA, uh, with distance. This is R sub X, and this is on the uh, foot wall side. And so we're seeing the attenuation of ground motion as you go away from uh, the top of the fault here on the foot wall. And this part of ground motion models are very well constrained. There's lots of foot wall or basically ground motions that aren't affected by these hanging wall effects. So that's a well-established part of ground motion models. But as we move over onto the hanging wall, uh, we see that the characteristics of the ground motion are different. There's, they're elevated for the same Rx. They're much more elevated than they were back here. And the effects extend quite a ways off uh, in this distance of positive Rx. To look at that a different way, uh, what this diagram is showing is if we take the ground motion on the hanging wall for a given Rx, let's say 15, 
and we divide it by the ground motion on the foot wall for that same distance, uh, you get an amplifying effect. Okay, and so the amplifying effect is is one. There is no amplification on the foot wall side, but when you go on the hanging wall, there are different representations of it. So this is how it actually appears in models. Um, and what you're looking at with these different lines are different models for this phenomenon from the NGA West 2 project. The point I would just make in connection with this is uh, while Northridge provides valuable data for what's going on there in the hanging wall, uh, it's not enough. And in fact, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, related to these models. And these models therefore could occupy many different spaces across here. This is just happens to be where they are. They're largely based on simulations and the available recordings are used to validate the simulations as best we can. Now this one here, uh, this is an earthquake since Northridge. Uh, we've been looking for additional earthquakes with hanging wall ground motions ever since. This one is kind of representative of a few where uh, we come close, we don't quite get there. So this is a Luzon earthquake in China. The epicenter is here. This is the fault rupture surface and the red triangles are ground motion records. So there are some here that we would say are affected by hanging wall effects. There are some back here that would be foot wall. So this is a potentially very valuable data set. Uh, there are papers written on this. You see the diagram is from Bay et al. But unfortunately, uh, this data is not available to us. Um, the Chinese government has not uh, released the data for use by the broader scientific community. And for the most part, that's kind of the case. We just don't have much information since Northridge, uh, although we do have now some new information that I think will be extremely valuable from Japan. Uh, Ken mentioned this in his talk, the uh, Norway Japan earthquake from earlier this year. This is a diagram that is showing all of the stations that recorded this earthquake across Japan. The ones that have usable recordings are green. The ones that are not usable are in gray. And then if we look at this inset here, uh, we see that this is the fault rupture surface. And uh, this little peninsula that comes out does have a whole series of recordings that are on the hanging wall. So we haven't actually looked at that yet. It's too new, but we will be integrating this data in the NGA West 3 project. And I'm sure that along with Northridge, this will be helpful for better constraining hanging wall effects. What I'd like to do next is uh, move to the other subject of my talk, which is Northridge earthquake ground failure. So ground failure, the way I'm using that term, it means uh, permanent deformations of the ground caused by an earthquake. So ground motion goes back and forth. You mostly end up where you started. Ground failure is a permanent shift. All right, so um, Northridge produced uh, many different types of ground failure and many, many incidents of ground failure. Uh, landslides was a big one. Uh, USGS with Randy Gibson documented many thousands of landslides. A lot of them were disrupted slides and falls like this one in the Pacific Palisades that intercepted this house. Some of them were coherent slides uh, like this one, which is the Del Val landslide. Uh, this photo is from Tim McCrank. And this is the Ramona oil field landslide. The landslide is moving like this. The image is from the United States Air Force. All of this was part of our uh, report back in 1994. Another type of ground failure that got a lot of attention uh, for good reason after the earthquake was seismic compression. It wasn't actually called that at the time, but the term sort of evolved a few years later. Seismic compression is when you have unsaturated soils that experience volume change during very strong shaking. And when you have volume change, you have settlement and there can be some lateral extension of fill slopes. So this is a house with obvious differential settlement that is racking this frame. Uh, and there is some extension of the fill as well. This is another house where uh, you have uh, fill on one side and you have cut on the other and you will often get these cracks at the cut field boundary. So a lot of uh, effort went into uh, understanding these effects and developing models to predict them. What I'll focus on though is really this third uh, source of ground failure, which is strength loss in loose saturated soils during cyclic or earthquake loading. 
Uh, this sounds a lot like liquefaction. Uh, and you might wonder why I'm not using the much more concise term liquefaction to describe that. And uh, I'll explain as I go along why I'm not using it. It's not, it's not necessarily the right term. And it's that ambiguity that, that makes this data so interesting and valuable to the present time. So I mentioned when, I, when Northridge happened, I was a grad student. Uh, we produced um, a report published in June of 1994 um, that was uh, a, a, as comprehensive as we could be a, a reconnaissance report of the geotechnical effects of the earthquake. This is one of the maps from that report, and it's showing the major incidents of ground failure in the San Fernando Valley. And uh, this is where most of the strength loss related ground failure happened. So just to get you oriented, Santa Susana Mountains to the north, Simi Hills to the south, Santa Monica Mountains, sorry, Simi Hills to the west, Santa Monica Mountains to the south. What you're looking at here is the street grid for the San Fernando Valley. The relatively thick lines are the boundaries of potentially susceptible soils based mainly on recent um, alluvial materials being present and shallow groundwater. That was from the LA County uh, safety element that had been published in 1990. And then I would just point your attention to all these little uh, symbols that are shown throughout the map. So these are the locations of uh, reported pipe breaks. In some cases, uh, there may be more than one symbol for a single pipe break. This is just reports as they came in as provided to us from LADWP. There are also some thicker symbols here, which are breaks in oil pipelines that was provided to us by the California State Fire Marshal. And I would just point out that there is a concentration of this activity uh, here in the Northridge area, down in Sherman Oaks. Uh, there's quite a bit concentrated here um, up uh, near Balboa Boulevard. I'll say more about that in a minute and a few other spots. And so we were describing these different incidents in our report. Just looking at a few of the effects as images. So this is at Malden Street in the Northridge area. You can see uh, ground cracking with some settlements and a little bit of extension in this case. This is a compressive feature uh, in the northern part of the San Fernando Valley in Granada Hills. You can see the pavement buckling. And this is the image you've seen a, a ground view of this already in Ken's talk. And I expect Craig will talk more about this. This is a major ground failure feature at Balboa Boulevard that ruptured both a gas pipeline producing fire once it was ignited and uh, flooding due to ruptured water lines. All right, so um, I wanna dig into that a little bit more um, and talk about the research that occurred with respect to these ground failures in the San Fernando Valley and how uh, they are of value to us. And in order to place the value of these case histories into context, you need to understand how a liquefaction analysis proceeds. There are three major steps to it uh, as in a modern analysis, and this is how the NGL project is organized. There's susceptibility. Susceptibility is solely related to mineralogy. Basically granular materials are, are susceptible. Materials with more of a, uh, clay-like uh, consistency uh, and mineralogy would not be. We, we make this determination independent of saturation and loading conditions. It's strictly related to the mineralogy of the soil. If something is susceptible, we evaluate triggering uh, related that considers the state of the soil, whether it's likely to be saturated or not, and how strong the ground shaking uh, is going to be. And then if it's triggers, we look at how severe the effects are. I would argue that from the perspective of understanding the value of the Northridge earthquake, susceptibility is the main uh, part of this. And I'll focus on that with the remainder of my time. Now, the reason we have this susceptibility step is there are very different uh, characteristics of material response for granular and clay soils. What we're looking at here is a uh, kind of a characteristic stress strain response and cyclic loading of a granular material. You see this is stress strain, and uh, these are different loops, and these loops pinch is the term that's used. There's a very small change uh, from this side of the curve to this side of the curve as you go through the origin. 
Uh, that pinching occurs because the stress path over here, which is effective stress uh, versus uh, the shear stress here, is migrating to the left. So that loss of stress is because of pore pressure generation. And you get to a point of nearly zero effective stress here on the left margin of the plot. That nearly zero effective stress accompanies severe strength loss, and that's why there's so much pinching there. So that's what a liquefiable soil looks like, and we call it liquefaction. We use liquefaction procedures for that. Cohesive soils are a little different. You, it, you see qualitatively kind of similar behaviors here, but there's much less pinching. These loops are quite a bit broader. The stress path does not go all the way to the left axis. There remains effective stress in these clayer soils. And so the strength loss, while it happens, is relatively modest. We call this type of behavior cyclic softening, and we use independent procedures for this than we use for liquefaction. So it's really the susceptibility step where we differentiate liquefaction from cyclic softening, and then we proceed down totally different paths. So I, I mention all of that because which of those you pick in some of these Northridge cases is unclear. Here's one good example, Balboa Boulevard slope movement. This is the plan view of Balboa Boulevard. Um, north is off to the left. And this zone here is a zone of extension. So it's basically the beginnings of a landslide, a scarp area. And this zone over here is a zone of compression. So essentially this section of earth was moving to the south uh, between this extension area and this compression area. If we now take a look at that same map here, uh, I just cut off the top and bottom part of it and work that happened subsequent to the earthquake to really characterize the geotechnical conditions along Balboa Boulevard is reflected in this diagram down here. These are CPT logs with tip resistance and the coloration inside of the log is indicative of the soil type. Um, so if we look between this extension area and this compression area, the first thing that I really want to point out is where the groundwater is. So the groundwater is coming above this boundary between unit C and unit D. This is young Holocene soils, stiffer soils below. This material down below is not going to be subject to ground failure. This one is, but you have to be above the groundwater table to have the strength loss. You get above the groundwater table right in the extension zone. Here it is above that boundary. It drops down below again as you pass through the compression zone. So the groundwater table being elevated is what caused this failure to happen. And then if we look in more detail at the CPT logs in this critical region, what do we see? We see some green. Green is essentially granular soils. So, okay, liquefaction. But then you come over here, or you come over here, or here, and you see very low tip resistances, and it's this intermediate type of soils as reflected by the CPT. You know, red would be clays, green is sands, but this is kind of intermediate. It's a little hard to tell which of those two end members you're having, and that kind of dominates uh, this particular case history. And as it turns out, quite a few of the other San Fernando Valley case histories as well. And that's really the point I want to leave you with is that it's not clearly one way or the other. And our analysis procedures do a pretty good job with the end members. They struggle with those intermediate cases. We're trying to deal with that in the NGL project, but it is one of our really big challenges. Okay, so I'm not going to say what we're doing about it just yet. There's not enough time for that. But I think this illustrates the value of the Northridge case histories and how they continue to challenge us. These are my references, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to present here. So that's the end for me. Thank you, John. As a reminder to all our attendees, you can uh, we're going to have a Q and A uh, discussion at the end. Please put questions for that ses session into the Q and A tool that you can find on your toolbar. We may answer some questions that has already happened. Uh, via text. So look in the answered tab to see an answer to a question that was asked already. Uh, next up, we're going to hear from Craig Davis, who worked for the LA Department of Water and Power for 32 years. He experienced, responded to, and helped the LADWP recover from the 1994 Northridge earthquake. 
He continues to research, develop, and implement into practice the resilience improvements for lifeline infrastructure systems and response-based methodologies with local and federal agencies. He was the founding chairperson for the ASCE Infrastructure Resilience Division and serves on EERI committees. Craig. Okay, uh, thank you, Mark. So I'm Craig Davis, and I'm going to present to you some topics on lifeline infrastructure systems. Uh, I'm gonna give you an overview of a number of systems, uh, including transportation, water, wastewater, natural gas, electric power, liquid fuels, telecommunications, and then go into some lifeline independencies and interactions and some fire following earthquake. So it's, it's pretty clear from that list that there were many different systems impacted by in Southern California by the Northridge earthquake. Most of those are in the red and yellow zones in the image off to the upper right. So this presentation will uh, only summarize a, a few aspects. Um, I got a thing in my way here. Uh, and that just messed up. So I'm only going to summarize a few aspects uh, to illustrate some key lessons. And please understand that these are complex systems and issues being summarized in, in really just a few minutes. So let's start with transportation, and I'll focus on the roadway, highway, and rail. So uh, there was debris blocking roads, landslide subsidence, and lateral spreading, as mentioned earlier, also affected transportation routes. Uh, there were also interactions with structures and co-located facilities. So uh, these caused some service disruption for days, weeks, or months, depending on uh, the location of the transportation line, the roadway or the highway. Um, there were bridge approach, settlement, and column support failures. There are 237 Caltrans bridges that experienced damage requiring repair. Uh, all of those uh, created some level of service disruption from minor to fairly significant. Seven of those bridges experienced severe damage or collapse, which cut off entire communities, including the one I live in. I live just north of Los Angeles. Um, and that disrupted millions of people, goods, and services for many months. And uh, But I do here want to give credit to Caltrans for implementing innovative methods to rapidly replace the bridges, uh, which was very significant post-earthquake. Um, the roadway and highway damage impeded response and recovery times. There was no major damage to real facilities, fortunately. And um, one train did derail, though, from seismic wave movement, which resulted in toxic spills. Uh, and uh, through redundant transportation systems, mostly through the commuter rail, uh, was able to pick up the dispersed highway uh, commuters. So here's some uh, pictures of four of those seven major damage bridges uh, provided by Caltrans. Just take a quick look at those. I'm not going to go into greater detail on those due to lack of time. Uh, so now let me quickly go through telecommunications. They performed quite well. Uh, there were switch failures that removed almost a quarter million lines for up to 13 and a half hours, uh, some due to loss of power. There were other switches that were damaged that caused uh, uh, the control network to limit access to almost 400,000 lines, which are, you know, phones, lines, um, and limited them to local dialing for up to eight hours. There were two inter-exchanges that failed preventing almost 2 million customers from connecting to long-distance uh, carriers for up to eight hours. Fortunately, the 911 system worked well throughout uh, uh, post-earthquake uh, from immediate to long time after. There was a huge call volume uh, increased by four, which caused further delays. And there were 35 cell sites that went down. All of those were stored within 72 hours. So now going into the water and sewer systems, those uh, mostly impacted the LA city systems. Uh, but there were other areas uh, surrounding L.A. That, that did have reasonably significant impacts to the water. So there were thousands of water pipe uh, repairs in total across the area. Uh, there was damage to aqueduct and transmission lines, damage to tanks, reservoirs, treatment plants. In total, there were uh, around a million or maybe over a million people impacted by loss of water services. Boil water notices were issued. There were loss of uh, firefighting water. 
All services throughout the area were restored within weeks. Uh, system repairs took years. Actually, at LADWP, it took us over 20 years to make all the repairs. Sewer systems, there were some pipe and treatment plant damages, but there were no substantial service losses to talk about. Natural gas is owned and operated by the Southern California Gas Company in this area. Uh, they had 35 transmission pipe damages, all of those to the old lines, uh, which caused uh, three fires from those 35 transmission lines damages. There were 154 distribution steel pipe damages. All of the newer pipes uh, performed quite well, which is good for current design practice. Uh, 151,000 customers were out of service. Now, 88% of those shut off their own service out of concern of a potential leak from gas. 51 natural gas-related uh, fires were ignited, all of those on private property. There are 172 mobile homes destroyed by fire because of lack of seismic bracing. And 82% of the customers for Southern California gas were restored within two to three weeks. So electric power, uh, most of the damages and the impacts were to the LA Department of Water and Power and Southern California Edison companies. Um, there was damage to transmission towers, converter and receiving stations. Uh, power is lost to the entire city of Los Angeles, all 4, 000, 4 million customers for the first time ever in its history. Uh, LA restored 93% of those customers within a day and a half and completed all service restore restorations within two days. Southern California Edison had 825,000 customer outages. All of those were restored within 20 hours. And what was really interesting here is that the power grid impacts uh, resulted in outages across the Western United States, all the way to Wyoming and up into Canada. I can't get into why that is, but there, it's an interesting feature of the grid. Uh, for liquid fuels, uh, there was one older 1925 transmission line that was damaged. No new pipes were damaged. There was an oil spill that caught fire. There were several oil spills. One of those caught fire and some gas station outages, some uh, related to power loss. So I'd like you to take a look at this on your own while I talk. Uh, so this is uh, lifeline service disruption and interactions. Uh, some examples from Northridge. I don't really have time to go through this, but I can make this presentation available. What this is trying to point out is that there are many interactions between the systems which are generally called dependencies and interdependencies and interactions with the lack of services to customers. And each lifeline system is a customer of the other lifeline systems. And that's how the term interdependency gets called up. So I'll give you some examples or implied throughout this description. Uh, now, I, I do wanna go through an interdependencies example on Balboa Boulevard. So Professor Stewart set this up nicely. Um, so in the lower right, we show a diagram of the location in the northern San Fernando Valley and all of the nine substructures that are underneath Balboa Boulevard. So it's basically everything throughout the the uh, the boulevard has been trenched and placed with uh, major lines. So uh, there was about a 20 inch ground displacement that was described by Professor Stewart that damaged not only the road, but water. Um, and natural gas pipelines. The new natural gas pipelines, as I mentioned earlier, were not damaged and that's significant here. So that fire is from gas from an old line that was actually being replaced. Uh, and it was in process of being replaced when the North Ridge earthquake struck. So as you see, the street got flooded. Uh, a spark from a truck that was uh, as shown in this and other photos ignited the gas coming from the old gas line uh, that burned homes and electrical lines that disrupted the communication cables, some which resulted in some of the losses that I mentioned earlier for telecommunications. Bob Boulevard, Boulevard is important to understand is designated as an emergency evacuation route. However, because of the performance of these lifeline systems in this ground flood area, it became an area that needed to be evacuated and could not really be used as a mass evacuation route. Um, and also the post earthquake repairs are difficult to coordinate between all these co-located uh, co uh, lifelines that were damaged, thus further extending the repair time because if one of these was damaged, you could get right in there. All of them having problems or concerns that needed to be investigated caused extensive time for repair, which is a good segue into fire following earthquake. 
Uh, there were 110 documented ignitions, that being only one of them. 80% of those were fires, uh, structure fires. Some natural gas ignitions were created because power was restored. So there's an interaction that was not on the earlier slide between power restoration and ignitions of natural gas that may be leaking inside homes. Um, the, remember, this is an area where we had water loss, and so we didn't have water to fight fires in some of these areas where these ignitions occurred. And so alternate water sources were needed. In this area, most common way to use that was uh, through swimming pools. So now let me go into some key lessons that were learned. First, I'll just it works. So lifeline components and all of these systems were mitigated after 1971 San Fernando earthquake. Uh, Dr. Hudnett gave a nice explanation of the San Fernando earthquake and followed up by some important aspects uh, through Professor Stewart that uh, uh, have implications here. But that 1971 San Fernando earthquake was devastating. It was a similar size earthquake in this same area, much for the most part, and caused devastation to every one of these lifeline systems. And the lifeline infrastructure systems was coined. Uh, it was because of the 1971 earthquake and the performance of these systems. So much of the systems were rebuilt and or mitigated. So that mitigation where it meets current standards performed quite well. There was mostly no damage and in some cases a little bit of damage and that they, they were able to help Keep, keep services in uh, uh, to customers or allowed them to be more rapidly restored than what happened in 1971. Now, those components that were not mitigated were damaged. So uh, very clearly, a uh, very important lesson that, that we learned. I just didn't have time to go over it in greater detail. Uh, size, uh, all systems after the 1994 earthquake learned from their vulnerabilities and identified the lessons learned and implemented more mitigations. But now I need to point out that mitigation of system improvement efforts do wane. And because uh, some of the things weren't not improved after 1971, and I would suspect this similarly after 1994 over time because of other pressures, uh, things don't always come up to what they need to be for future events. This, uh, the 1971-1994 sequence is a good example of that. But this can be accomplished through good uh, leadership. It's difficult to do, as I mentioned, because of all the different pressures upon the agencies. But when doing it and thinking about multi-hazard mitigations, it's really important. Uh, another key lesson is a segue from Professor Stewart's presentation is the uncertainty in seismic hazards, their intensities, and the impacts on life lengths. So seismic ground motion was greater than anticipated, especially over top of the fault that Professor Stewart pointed out. And that's where most of these damages did occur. So we do better understand those now, but there is still very high uncertainty. Feed ground deformations, uh, we could not have, they could not have been predicted in all locations, even in Balboa Boulevard, they would not have been predicted prior to the 1994 earthquake. And those uh, where the PGG were expected, there's still high uncertainty in the displacements that they would have. These have very significant impacts on lifeline infrastructure systems. The uncertainty in geotechnics is not properly considered in lifeline earthquake engineering. And uh, this has huge implications for the design of the most critical components within these systems. Now, let me go on to some uh, human aspects. So all systems are uh, did utilize mutual aid and assistance to recover their services. They did that using internal and external uh, resources to the system. So internal would be, for example, Southern California Edison or LEDWP bringing resources from areas uh, where they served that were not seriously impacted by the Northern resources to make the recoveries. External is through other agencies coming to help. Um, so there were difficulties in providing emergency services to these workers. For example, food, housing, toilets, and materials, and other things were not really uh, readily available during the disasters for the days after the earthquake while they're making these repairs. Uh, and, and the systems all had to scramble to find out how to make this happen. They were not ready for that aspect. Uh, the lifeline services, you know, and this is important to understand, the lifeline services cannot be maintained 
nor restored. So they can't be maintained even on a daily basis, nor restored after an earthquake without the proper human actions and their, their associated coordinations. And then lastly, on this slide, I want to point out that the customers and users of these services have to just uh, adapt when their services are disrupted. So let's do a quick recap before I wrap up. So on January 17th, in the earthquake near source area, what you see on this map here, uh, people were shaken awake in, at 4.31 a.m. I was one of those people. There is no water or power when you get up. Uh, the fires are being ignited. There are toxic spills throughout the area. The streets are flooded from broken water lines. Uh, phones don't work. You cannot call for help. You cannot get information. Televisions aren't working. You have to have the right type of AM radio to be able to, to utilize to get information. The transportation routes are interrupted. Think about Bola Boulevard. Um, how can people evacuate or even get help? during the situations. And then we move into response and recovery. Well, they, they're hampered. Uh, the the food, fuel, you know, in fact, it was difficult to, to support the workers making the repairs or even get the workers there to inspect and make the repairs that are needed. The food, fuel, uh, and other things, uh, this required the adaptations for customers and users of the infrastructure systems. So, so now think about this. We have human-built technical infrastructure systems that have service losses. Those service losses are no longer supporting the community during the disaster. And in fact, are themselves adding to, and in some places, creating the disaster itself. Now, that's what I would not identify as the best of performances. That's not what we want, but that is actually what throughout earthquake country and throughout the country where earthquakes can occur. However, with that said, I would suggest all things considered that these systems were fairly resilient because resilience is usually described in terms of rapid recovery. And as you pointed out, you know, most things are covered within a day or recovered within a day, two days, a couple of weeks uh, for all of their services. That's, that's actually pretty good for disasters across the world. Um, so they were able to recover those services in a fairly timely manner. Uh, this is a result of having experienced in this particular area 23 years prior a similar sized earthquake and making improvements because of that. Uh, that paid dividends in 1994. But I have to ask the question, what about the areas that are not as prepared? Those areas that have never experienced an earthquake, those people that don't understand what happens during an earthquake or other type of a disaster. What about this area or other areas where there are larger events, right? So you got, we're prepared for a magnitude 6.7, but are we prepared for larger ones in the San Fernando Valley? And what about those areas that never really prepared their infrastructure to this level because they never experienced an earthquake? Okay, so now let's get into service recovery. So this earthquake revealed the importance of recovering basic services to customers. I'm showing you an example of recovery curves for basic services identified by the LA Department of Water and Power uh, that are uh, designated as water delivery, water quality, water quantity, and fire protection. These are quantifiable, they're measurable, and I'm plotting them. Um, so these in fact were the targets used to restore the system after the earthquake. And that's where this idea of the basic services come from. If you wanna restore water delivery for those who don't have it, then you wanna get them the quality that they need to, for public health and so on. So, so um, these basic services can similarly be fine for other infrastructure systems. Now, post-event, Lifeline infrastructure systems focus on life safety, public health, property protection, uh, continuing serv uh, containing the system service losses to get control of the situation, and making repairs and system adaptations to restore their services. Uh, that's kind of the, the correct order in general that they will be thinking about it. Now, that those items are addressed, uh, the first three items are addressed in code standards and regulations and through emergency response plans. The fourth item is generally addressed in emergency response plans, at least in part. But the restoration services, where, where in fact, are they addressed as far as when they should be restored? Well, there are no design procedures or response activities targeting service recovery time within a defined 
duration. That's the key term to define duration. What is rapid recovery and when do we achieve it? When is a system resilient and to which sized event? Is it one day, one week, one month, one year? Is that acceptable? If that is acceptable, why is that acceptable? When is it acceptable? Uh, and you have to think about uh, the rapidity or rapid to one individual may be slow to another because. So service recovery, the concept of basic services is now uh, fundamental knowledge for service recovery based design. If you missed or advance in the concept of functional recovery, knowledge gained from the Northridge earthquake and other events formed the basis for uh, the concept of lifeline system functional recovery. Service recovery and recovery-based design needs to be accounted for uh, through all the concepts identified uh, for the Northridge earthquake given in this presentation and probably other things. Uh, service users, uh, the service uses by all users, the user adaptations and the times when users need the services restored. Service recovery should become a basis for how we design lifeline infrastructure systems along with safety and public health. And that concludes my presentation. So uh, I would like to hand this back to Mark and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Craig. Next up, we have David Koch, who's been practicing structural engineering in California since 1981, founding Structural Focus in 2001. After 20 years with another firm, he's a licensed structural engineer in California and 15 other states and is past president of the SEI and EERI and currently on the NIST Advisory Committee on Earthquake Hazard Reduction and also has great uh, experience with the Loma Prieta and Cape Mendocino earthquakes arriving in Los Angeles in the early afternoon of January 17, 1994. David, please go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? I assume everybody can hear, can hear me. Yes, okay, okay good. Okay, so um, I'm going to be covering buildings, and I'm going to start by saying I wasn't here to experience the earthquake. I actually woke up in the morning of January 17th in Northern California, and I heard there was a big earthquake in Southern Cal. I talked to my wife, I packed a bag, I dropped my two boys off at school, and a few hours later I was in Burbank. My presentation today is not going to be in great detail. But my job here is to do an introduction to some of the big topics related to building performance during the earthquake. So what happened? You've heard a description of the earthquake and the intensity. The ground motions uh, were um, very close to code design levels and there was a strong component. Over 2,500 dwelling units were lost or severely damaged and over 1,600 homes and apartment buildings were declared uninhabitable. 82,000 residential and commercial units and 5,400 mobile homes were damaged or destroyed. About 100 or so large steel frame buildings had significant cracking in their uh, critical beam connections and nine parking structures collapsed and nine area hospitals required evacuation because of structural and non-structural systems. The graphic you can see here, it may not be very clear, but it does show the spread of the red tag buildings. Those are those, all those little dots. Nearly 3,000 buildings were red tagged and 13,500 were yellow tagged. I remember being surprised by the damage that we found in Santa Monica, but not really a whole lot of damage in downtown LA, but there was quite a spread throughout the area. Unreinforced masonry buildings. Uh, and you'll see over there on the right, I'm trying to list the ordinances, at least from LA City, that are applicable to each of these building types and what's happened since the earthquake. So you can get a, a feel for uh, the response. Although unreinforced masonry construction was recognized by codes in 1933 after uh, the Long Beach earthquake as an unsuitable structural material, and no unreinforced masonry buildings have been constructed since about 1949. It wasn't until 1977 that the Seismic Safety Commission and Senator Alquist began a push for legislation to address the hazard posed by the tens of thousands of URM buildings. The state first passed the Hazard Redu Reduction Bill SB 547 in 1986. So that was a long time after 1933. 
It required an inventory of all the URM buildings in the state, but left it up to the local jurisdictions to decide whether to make the retrofits voluntary or mandatory. Many of the several thousands of buildings that were retrofitted since 1982 were strongly shaken by the Northridge earthquake, and most survived without the total collapse previously expected for such structures. Tilt-up buildings. Several tilt-up structures in the valley exhibited uh, extreme damage to their diaphragms and wall failures, some resulting in the collapse of the perimeter wall and a loss of vertical support for the roof framing. Very quickly after the earthquake, changes were made to increase the capacity of the diaphragms and the connections to the walls. You'll see in that Division 91 date, that's dated February 4th, 1994. So that was within weeks that some changes were made to retrofit the buildings. There was a, also a continuation of that with uh, Division 96. Steel moment frame buildings. Prior to the earthquake, the structural engineering community, community believed that the st steel moment frame system was the best lateral force resisting system available. A few days after the earthquake, reports started drifting in of damage to welded moment frame connections. At first, we gave no credence to those reports at all until they kept coming. Ultimately, about 100 steel buildings were found to be earthquake damaged. These surprises led to the formation of the SAC Steel Project, a joint venture between SEOC, the Applied Technology Council, and Curie. The project examined the observed damage, conducted research projects over several years, and eventually provided recommendations for inspections, repair techniques, retrofitting, and new detailing requirements, all which were incorporated into our future building codes. Nine parking structures collapsed. You can uh, note the ductile behavior of the perimeter columns at the Cal State Northridge parking structure in the upper left. See the horizontal lines in the outside face of those columns. But it was the interior columns that failed in a non-ductile manner and triggered the collapse, generally thought to be a short column effect at the ramps in the middle of the structure. At the Northridge Fashion Center below, the connections and the non-ductile detailing of the precast concrete system resulted in a devastating collapse. Codes have since been modified to address both of these issues and several others. The Northridge Meadows apartment complex caused the most casualties of any one site during the earthquake. 16 people died, all lived on the ground floor. Clearly this type of building configuration is susceptible to collapse. So remember, this is 1994 when this happened. In 2015, Los Angeles Mayor Garcetti finally had the political backing to form a special task force and made recommendations for a mandatory retrofit ordinance passed in 2015. LA identified 13,500 soft story buildings. As of uh, 2020, 88% were completed. This is, a, uh, this is as of February 1st with the soft story buildings. And you can see over on the right that the uh, that we have completed about 70, 76% have completed the rest, uh, the construction of the retrofit. So they're well on their way to making it. So this is probably one of the most spectacular structural collapses resulting from the Northridge earthquake, non-ductile concrete buildings. Clearly this is an older concrete building with what we call non-ductile steel reinforcing details. So this earthquake occurred in 1994, uh, which was 23 years after the San Fernando earthquake and the observation of non-ductile behavior of the brand new Olive View Medical Center and Veterans Hospitals. Again, it wasn't until LA's Mayor Garcetti formed a special task force that made recommendations for mandatory retrofitting of older buildings, older concrete buildings passed in 2015. So we have to wonder what took so long Again, this is the progress made as of February 1st. This is a much bigger problem, uh, much more expensive type of retrofit, 
more complicated and bigger buildings. So as of February 1st, there's been 72 out of the roughly 1,200 buildings that have actually completed their retrofit. There's a 25 year compliance date from the notice of the, uh, from their notification from the city and there's steps along the way. But again, only 72 have been completed so far and we have a long ways to go. A couple of other items I wanna to touch on. One of them is building safety inspections. Here's a quote from uh, Stuart Tom who was with LADBS at the time and when I talked to him, he was the chief building official at City of Glendale. After experiencing the widespread effects of the Northridge earthquake had on the entire LA Basin region, I'm convinced that a pre-established private-public partnership is the most effective path to rapid recovery of individual business institutions. This was started, this concept first came out in San Francisco. It was called Building Occupancy Resumption Program, put together after the smoke and dust had cleared from the Loma Prieta earthquake in the early 1990s. Since then, uh, several programs have been established throughout the West Coast. There's several in Southern California that we've worked with and FEMA funded a guidelines document that was published last January, a year ago. There are three systems in place now to provide inspectors. Number one, the local jurisdictions have their own building inspectors. Number two, the local jurisdiction can request inspectors from other regions throughout the state and through from organized by the Office of Emergency Services. Of course, that takes several days. And three, an accelerated building reoccupancy program can be organized by the local jurisdiction. And those guidelines have uh, recently been uh, published for anybody that might be interested. And then finally, I wanna talk about the future. And uh, Craig did a great job on touching on this concept of functional recovery. Earthquake resistant design, especially as required by building codes, has always been primarily about safety. Over the last few years, policymakers and advocates have begun calling for better than code seismic design. A productive way to think about this goal was to envision codes and standards written to achieve not only safety, but also acceptable recovery times. In the normal code development process, we believe that the functional recovery concept will be included and embedded in the model building codes in about 10 years, but we'd love to accelerate that. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, David, and thank you to all our presenters. We only have a few minutes just to point out that if you click on the Q&A tab on your toolbar, you'll be able to see some answered questions that were answered uh, via text. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and ask Craig one that is here, uh, that was just put in, uh, it was a, from an anonymous attendee. I was wondering if you can shed light on the scenario of populated displacement and migration in and out around the impacted area, if possible. Also, can you provide source information for the water service recovery curve plot. Maybe some of that you can do live and some of it you can do by text and everybody definitely go look at those answered questions. Okay, um, so two different types of questions, uh, in part they're related. Um, the migration in and out, that's more of a social type question. And uh, there was, some migration out of the area because there were a lot of homes damaged and people couldn't stay in that area. Uh, temporarily, and I don't know the numbers for this particular event of Northridge, but we do know that uh, temporarily when utilities are out, that causes people to relocate, sometimes to hotels and other areas, sometimes to friends. Sometimes they'll just, uh, I know of some people that actually went to Minnesota permanently. They did not want to live in Southern California anymore. So there were people that left. There's actually a migration in for the repairs and recovery of which some actually stayed. Um, I can only answer this generically. I don't know if others have any uh, input on that, but um, th there is migration in and out. I know that it happened in Northridge. I can't give numbers. I know that it happens in any major significant event, including hurricanes and tornadoes and so on. 
um, the, to get to the the data for the curves came directly from the LA water system. So those curves plots were identifying the areas uh, we plotted maps after the earthquake of what areas had no service. We knew the areas that didn't have service of any water. We knew areas that had low pressure, couldn't have the quantity of water. We knew areas where we uh, notice, which means that you don't have the quality of water that you're expecting and, and so on. And we knew the areas where you couldn't fight fires. We plotted those, we identified the number of customers in there, and that's how those uh, we took those numbers and then I plotted those those response curves over time. Thanks, Craig. Um, Excellent. Uh, there is a, a question I just wanted to share to everybody that reporting so today's webinar, the recording of it, and also the presentations will be shared. Now, uh, you all come in to the webinar from different places. Uh, if you register through ASCE, you'll be able to find it through there. And also, uh, you can, we'll put this on the EERI SoCal website, socal.eeri.org. And I did answer that question in the Q&A. Uh, so you can find links there too, and put it on the Earthquake Country site as well. Um, the, uh, looks like some other questions were were answered uh, in the text. Uh, Craig, one uh, question here. It seems like LA municipalities have made progress making water infrastructure seismically resilient. Which utilities are doing that for sewer pipes given the interdependency issues? And are there standards for that? Um, there actually are no serious standards for water seismic design of water pipelines anywhere uh, in this country. So water or sewer, those are attempted to be made. There are some guidelines, but those are not standards. So there is no actual seismic design requirements for water or sewer pipelines. Um, there are areas where sewer pipelines are being installed uh, for seismic improvements. I know in the Bay Area, there's some. In Southern California, there are some. Orange County Sanitation District has been doing studies uh, for their crossing of faults with their sewer lines and outfalls and so on. So it happens. Uh, I can't give you a lot of specifics other than Orange County San. I know that there were some specific designs in LA sanitation for cr fault crossings, um, but I can't give the specifics on that because I don't okay. know them in greater detail. Hey, David, uh, you, you talked a lot about the building performance of, uh, during the earthquake and different types of buildings that uh, remain in, in the stock. Uh, uh, why is it taking so long to get those buildings retrofit and, and what can we do going forward? That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I don't wanna sound flippant, but sometimes it would be best to have an earthquake every two or three years. It doesn't hurt anybody and cause any major property damage, just as a reminder. We found that um, every time we have an earthquake, we have a, an opportunity um, of just this window of opportunity to try to make some changes in our design and our construction um, habits. And um, it's really unusual to get changes made like in 2015 with Mayor Garcetti. And I, I will give actually one of the writers at the LA Times some credit for that. He started doing some research on non-ductile buildings and soft story buildings and wrote some articles that got people's attention. And that, um, you know, that led to the mayor recruiting Lucy Jones to put together a task force and make some recommendations that eventually got uh, approved by city council. But it you got to have the political power. You have to. It's an emotional thing. Um, people have to get a little scared, if you will, and um, and and that's when you can get things um, get things to happen. Thanks, David. Mm -hmm. Okay, we are. If at I time. could, uh, Mark, I know ahead. we're just about to close it out here, but just the recent activity in and around LA, the 4.2 near Wrightwood, the 4.1 near San Bernardino, and then most recently last Friday, the 4.6 at Malibu. And then down in El Centro, this swarm that's going on with the largest event was a 4.8 uh, 
just uh, Monday. And even this morning, um, that activity migrated northward toward the southern San Andreas and at uh, Bombay Beach. So these are things that do heighten people's awareness. So maybe there will be other windows of opportunity like David just described it. We certainly want to encourage people to keep doing the right thing with seismic resilience. Okay, well, thank you all for your great presentations and thanks to those to you who have uh, asked questions. Again, everything is going to be shared on the different websites. Uh, we, this is a series, so you'll be, uh, stay tuned for the announcement of the, the next webinar and uh, uh, through the same channel that you learned about today's. And thank you again for joining us.